Good afternoon. This is Ron Klein. I'm chairman of Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be joined by distinguished voting rights attorney Mark Elias, who will be introduced to you in a moment. Uh, but before we start, let me just spend a minute and uh, explain uh, JDCA, for those who aren't familiar. Jewish Democratic Council of America is an organization, a 501c4 organization that was formed a couple of years ago to support, promote, and help elect and support uh, public officials in Washington, the Senate, the House, and the presidency who support our Jewish community's interests, policies, uh, at the at the U.S. level, you know things in the United States such as immigration policy, gun policy, education, healthcare, and to fight against anti-Semitism, as well as uh, a support the strategic relationship with the state of Israel. Uh, we endorse candidates, we support them, and we help elect them. In the last uh, midterm election, we uh, had about an 84% success rate in challenging and tough races, and we're very proud of the fact that we've built very strong relationships in the United States Congress. We're doing the same thing this time around as well as with the presidential race. And uh, we think more than ever, it's uh, gonna be a very important election for us all to be engaged, to vote, to talk to our friends and neighbors and to work aggressively to help elect the Democrat. Uh, at this moment in time, of course, uh, we hope that you and your families are doing well and you're taking care of yourselves. That's the most important thing. This is These are unprecedented times and historic moments and uh, as a country, we need to band together and hopefully fight off this uh, this unfortunate uh, virus. Um, at the uh, we, we, what we've decided in order to sort of uh, help provide good information, good quality information to uh, all of us and uh, people interested in these policies, is to bring together a series of uh, speakers and people who are very much at the top of the uh, profession of working in specific areas dealing with the coronavirus. Um, and uh, we're gonna learn to adapt to the normal uh, of, of how we both face these, these challenges by getting this type of information in front of us. This is something that's impacting every aspect of our lives. Uh, we know from our healthcare to elections, to education and the economy. And it's because of these concerns that we're putting together what we're calling Democrats responding to Congress. I'm sorry, responding to the coronavirus. Um, today's call, we're gonna focus on the future of elections in light of the pandemic including an issue we're going to hear a lot more about, which is vote by mail. And we're very lucky today to be joined by the foremost ex expert on this subject, someone who's been on the front lines of securing our right to vote for many years, attorney Mark Elias. Before we introduce and hear from Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to one of our JDCA board members, Michael Rosenzweig from Atlanta, to briefly talk about his experience in Georgia when it comes to voting rights. Michael? Thank you, Ron. Uh, <clears throat> appreciate being on the call. Yeah, it, Georgia, I think many people on the call know, we've certainly experienced voter suppression historically, uh, most notably in our last election for governor in 2018. Uh, at that time, our then Secretary of State, Republican Brian Kemp, uh, was clearly responsible for large-scale voter purges and other voter disenfranchisement efforts. And, uh, of course, he was also at the same time a candidate for governor. And uh, most observers believe that those uh, voter suppression efforts probably played a significant role in his victory by a very slim margin uh, over Stacey Abrams. I think everybody knows Stacey has since then become a national leader in the Democratic Party and in particular uh, in uh, efforts with respect to voter suppression and disenfranchisement. Uh, she has an organization called Fair Fight, and Mark Elias, in fact, is very involved with that organization. And uh, I'm happy to be on this call with Mark because he is on the front lines in Georgia and obviously in other battleground states, all to, to uh, safeguard American voting rights. Georgia is like many other states. We're now grappling with how to hold our primary elections uh, during this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, our presidential primary, in fact, was scheduled to take place today. It's now been postponed until May 19th. We in Georgia have two primaries, one for presidential uh, primary alone and then one for uh, general primary. But unless large scale changes take place, we still have concerns uh, in Georgia. And of course, now we are concerned in particular that coronavirus may make voting even more difficult. And uh, we fear that it could open the door to more voter suppression. So. I personally am very grateful to hear from Mark today about his efforts to secure our voting rights uh, in Georgia, but also uh, across the country. 
So with that, I will uh, uh, turn this over to our executive director at JDCA, Haley Soifer, and she will introduce uh, Mark Elias. Haley. Great. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Ron. We're thrilled today to start our call series, uh, which is Democrats Responding to Crisis, and to start it with Mark Elias. Mark is the chair of the Perkins Coie Political Law Group, where he's a nationally recognized authority and expert in campaign finance, voting rights, and redistricting law and litigation. And he is one of the leading recount and post-election attorneys in the country. Mark represents dozens of U.S. senators, governors, representatives, and their campaigns, as well as the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and many others. He serves as the general he served as the general counsel to Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016 and John Kerry's presidential campaign in 2004. Thank you, Mark, so much for joining us at this critical time. And as a reminder to those on the call, all lines are muted, but please send your questions for Mark to info at jewishdems.org, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, and thank you uh, for doing this series. Um, I'm honored to be your first speaker, but it sounds uh, just looking down the the list, if I can give a plug for the future speakers, it sounds like this is going to be a real um, service uh, to the uh, Jewish community, the Democratic community, and in fact, uh, to in fact, uh, beyond. So um, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, let me start by approaching this in by by sort of zooming out from COVID and and discussing where we have been, um, and and then sort of pivoting to to what this particular circumstance um, that we find ourselves in is going to mean to voting. Um, so we have a system of elections in this country which is which is um, deeply decentralized. So you have state-run systems, then within states you oftentimes have counties in some places like Michigan. Um, elections are actually administered at the sub-county level by the municipalities. Um, so we have a very decentralized system of election that uses different kinds of technology, anything from in-person voting on optical scan ballot to touchscreen machines, although there are relatively few of those anymore, um, to vote by mail, early vote, um, no excuse absentee, excuse absentee, requirements of witness sign witnesses to, to witness absentee ballots, no, no witness requirements. We have a very, very different set of and complicated set of rules. And um, that poses some real challenges without the coronavirus. Um, it poses challenges because it is largely based on a series of norms and people participating in certain predictable ways for it to work. So, for example, um, most of the people who man uh, po in-person polling locations um, tend to be older, um, uh, retired, uh, and they are quasi volunteers. They're paid, but they're but they're not paid a substantial amount of money, and they're 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 really doing this as sort of a, a way to give back um, uh, to the community. Um, we we cite polls in um, uh, in public schools, in buildings, um, sometimes in private locations, that depend on uh, those buildings being available and uh, uh, and everything uh, being unlocked on election day. Um, so even in a normal circumstance where we have, you know, blue skies, perfect weather, no virus to be found anywhere in sight, everyone in great health, um, our elections are are plagued by um, the problems that come from having a highly um, volunteer dependent or or, or part-time dependent uh, decentralized process. So. So I would have so I, what I would have said um, uh, if I had given this talk before uh, before coronavirus. In fact, I gave a talk similar to this on March 4th. Is that the biggest problem facing um, Americans in voting um, are long lines, um, and long lines are a symptom of the problem that I just articulated, which is that we basically don't have enough people staffing enough 
voting locations and enough voting locations opened for there to be surge voting. So um, it doesn't mean that we have uniform long lines everywhere, but we but we have experienced, and if you remember uh, this primary in California, we saw unacceptable long lines. In Texas, we saw uh, lines lasting as, as long as seven and a half hours. Um, and and so we are experiencing those long lines because there's essentially a a misallocation or a or not enough people or machines or locations to go around. Typically, the problem is not actually not enough machines. Typically, um, the problem uh, the problem have to do with enough poll workers or enough polling locations. So before coronavirus, what I would have said is we need to tackle. The, we need to tackle two problems. One is um, solving the problem of voting access, which is in part, like I said, uh, a lines problem. It's a it's a availability problem. It's having enough early voting days. It's it's making sure that polls are situated close to public transportation lines and the like, so that we can we can process a surge of, of voting, which is what we have seen in the primaries and the early primaries and what we expect to see in November. A um, lot, of, lot of enthusiasm or attention to this election and making sure we can process that all through. Because as I said to an audience that I, that I mentioned I talked to on the 4th of March, how long would you wait in line to vote? If I told you all on this call right now that you would wait an hour in line to vote no matter what time you showed up or where you went, you know, some number of you wouldn't 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 wait the hour. You wouldn't vote. If I told you it was two hours, more of you wouldn't wait. If I told you it was five hours, very few of you would wait. Many of you would say you'd wait, but in fact, you wouldn't. You wouldn't stand in, in line with a stranger in front of you, a stranger behind you for five hours in order to vote. And yet that's the reality that we see year after year, in and particularly in presidential years. In, 20, 2000, in 2004, you probably recall the images of the long lines on college campuses in Ohio. In 2008, there were long lines in many places in the country. 2012, uh, President Obama actually, during his uh, uh, victory speech on election night, called out the problem of long lines. Um, long lines were then the subject of a presidential commission, yet we saw line, long lines again in 2016, and then, like I said, in the primaries in 2020. So. So if we were having this conversation without coronavirus, what we'd be talking about is how we solve that. And that's solved by more vote by mail um, and more early vote, in addition to the other things I mentioned about opening more polling locations. So that would have been the one thing we talked about. The second thing we would have talked about are Republican efforts at voter suppression. And we continue to see a wave of Republican legislatures that find ever increasing ways in increasingly creative ways to make voting harder. And they don't tend to make voting harder for everybody. They make voting harder for particular groups. So in 2013, they passed the law in North Carolina. I was involved in litigating and challenging um, where the Fourth Circuit found that they passed the law um, uh, that was targeted at, at African Americans, quote, with surgical precision. So imagine a legislature sitting down saying, let's make voting harder. Then they asked for uh, the, their legislative staff to score those changes to say, okay, will this will this disenfranchise more white voters and more black voters? And they chose the provisions that would disenfranchise more black voters. So that's 2013. Now you might think that's the end of the story. I just sued Arizona successfully. Um, Arizona had uh, for many uh, has about 70% of the population vote by mail. Um, uh, in the uh, in the um, uh, in 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 the process of encouraging people to vote by mail. Um, there has be, been a, um, a reliance on third-party organizations to gather and collect and deliver uh, ballots uh, for processing, particularly on Native American reservations and portions of the Hispanic community and uh, among college students. Uh, the legislature passed a law banning that practice, and the Ninth Circuit upheld our or ruled in our favor um, uh, recently within the last couple of months, saying that that provision, that ban on ballot collection by those groups, was also passed with a intent, int an intent to discriminate based on race. So it wasn't that it happened to have the effect of disenfranchising minority voters. It, that was actually the intent of the law. So, um, so 
th so that's the second thing that I would have told you we face. We face long lines and processing enough people just based on the rickety system we have. And then the second is Republican voter suppression. Um, what uh, Now, what happened is now COVID has come along, and COVID has further complicated this in some really meaningful ways. So let me start by giving one piece of very clear, hopefully, assurance, um, which is that um, primary dates are set by states. States with some limitation can choose the date of their primary election. Um, that is not true with the general election. The general election is set by federal law. It is the Tuesday following the first uh, Monday in November, uh, and that date cannot be moved. Uh, the President of the United States can't move that date, a governor can't move that date, the state legislature can't move that date. The only way that date can move is if Congress passes a new law, and there is no chance Congress is going to pass a new law. So we will have an election, we will have a general election on the Tuesday following the first Monday in November. You can take it to the bank, it's going to happen. So the question then is, what do we do about that fact, right? What do we do about the fact that there is going to be this election, it can't be moved, no matter how many sick people there are, no matter how much fear people have about being in um, close quarters with others. And, you know, what I've said to, I wrote an op-ed to the Washington Post about increased vote by mail, and. And vote by mail is clearly a big part of the solution. Um, um, but I want to be clear about this. Um, that is not to say that we should abandon in-person voting and, and move to a country of only vote by mail. There are three states that essentially have only, in per only have vote by mail, Colorado, um, Washington, and Oregon. They work very well for those states. But different states have different cultures. Different communities have different cultures. And there are places in the United States where you know where the the act of going and voting in person is very very important culturally or demographically and so um, we need to recognize that vote by mail is a big part of the solution because it is something voters are going to demand and public health officials are going to want. And it also solves some of the lines problems that I mentioned. So it was something that needed to be part of the solution anyway, even before COVID. But now it's going to be a much bigger part of that solution um, because um, it's, it should be made available to everyone. No one should not have the ability to vote a non, no excuse absentee ballot or a vote by mail ballot. Um, everyone should be, if they, everyone who wants to vote um, remotely in that way should be able to do so. Um, but there are still going to be communities that don't want to do that, and there are still going to be people who don't want to do that, and they should still have a safe way of showing up at a polling location, either early or, during, or on election day. Um, and casting a ballot. So that's really what I see as the as the prescriptive part of this is how do we bring ourselves as a country to both encourage the expansion of vote by mail and encourage people to take advantage of it while not telling people who don't want to take advantage of it or who have less trust in that system um, that that we're taking away their their in-person voting options. So we kind of need to do both with the understanding that people are going to vote with their feet, so to speak, by by doing more vote by mail. The, the vote by mail, the, the absentee ballot numbers out of Wisconsin that I saw this morning were absolutely through the roof. This is not a state that has a history or tradition of in-person, I'm sorry, of absentee voting, and yet the primary numbers were pretty, pretty staggering. Um, how many absentee ballots have been requested. So, um, so I think we're going to see more and more of it, um, understanding that we need to provide safeguards. Now, what are some of those safeguards? And this is really where I've spent so much of my attention in the last week, for those of you who have either followed what I've um, written on my website, democracydocket.com, or on Twitter, or whatever, you, you have seen that I, I have promoted four, what I call the four pillars of protecting voting rights for, vote, for when using vote by mail. And I think it's really important that as we as a community um, uh, go about encouraging um, more access to voting and in, and promoting vote by mail. We are we are also making sure that we are not having blind spots on some of the places that disenfranchise voters. So let me just lay out what those four are, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Um, number one, postage has to be free or prepaid by the government. Um, there is no reason why the states, if they're providing absentee ballots, can't. 
uh, provide free postage. Candidly, there's no reason why the post office can't simply decree, declare that all mail ballots don't need stamps at all from anyone. They just get processed uh, through the postal service, but one way or another postage uh, needs to be free. Uh, some states provide that, some states don't. Second, um, is that uh, that ballots postmarked on or before election day have to count. So some states, um, if you mail the ballot and it's postmarked by election day, it counts even if it comes in a few days after. Other states, if it is not received by election day, it doesn't count. Um, I understand the reason why people have that second approach, which is received by election day, which is that they want to be able to announce the full results of the election on election night. I am here to tell you that the difference between postmarked by and received by um, uh, is among, uh, among many constituencies of the Democratic Party is huge. Um, and I'll give you a couple of, um, I'll give you a, a, a couple of sort of statistics to, um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to go off of. Um, I am suing right now Arizona over there. They have an election day uh, cut off, so it has to be received by election day. Um, and we are suing on behalf of a organization, Voto Latino. Um, and uh, the study, the data we have in the studies we've produced show that the election day deadline is four times more likely to disenfranchise Hispanic voters than white voters, and five and a half times more likely to disenfranchise Native American voters than white voters. Um, looking at Florida, there was a study just released from the ACLU of Florida that looked at this. I have slight, very comparable data. It's slightly different, uh, looking at a different time period. Uh, but uh, in Florida in 2018, the rejection rates for vote by mail for those 18 to 21 were 5.4 percent compared to 0.6 percent for those over 65. And the rejection rates for blacks was 1.9 percent and Hispanics 2.1 percent compared to whites, which was 0.9 percent. So just to give you, you know, so what we know is that when we have vote by mail and we have these restrictions, they disproportionately affect, affect brown and black uh, voters and they disproportionately affect young voters versus old voters. Um, uh, there was a, a study several years ago in which we looked at the Colorado system, which is all vote by mail, um, and looked solely at rejections based on signature mismatching, which I'm about to discuss, um, and they were 60, uh, they were 62 percent Democratic rejections and 38 percent Republican rejections. So, um, so these kinds of these kind of uh, cutoffs and law tweaks um, can matter um, significantly. So. Uh, that's ballot postmark. The third is signature matching laws, which I mentioned. Um, in 2018, 68,000 eligible voters had their mail ballots discarded because election officials, often with no training and, f and with few, if any, safeguards um, against uh, a false mismatch, concluded that the, signature sign the voter's signature on the ballot return envelope did not match the voter's signature on file. So what happens in most states is when you vote absentee or by mail, you sign the outer envelope. When it comes for processing, they compare the signature on the outer envelope with the signature on file. And in 2018, 68,000 of those ballots were rejected because the person thought, the, the election worker thought that the signatures didn't match. Um, there are another 56,000 who had their votes thrown out because they simply forgot to sign the ballot return envelope. And most of, most of those voters and many of the 68,000 were never told or given an opportunity to cure a problem with their signature. Signature matching is, is um, a problem in the way in which it's administered in most states. Um, I have been suing states over signature match. I've sued uh, Florida twice. I've sued Georgia. In fact, Georgia just settled a, uh, a case with us in which they're going to adopt better standards. I'm suing Michigan. Uh, state of Michigan just lost its motion to dismiss against my lawsuit today. Um, and I expect we're going to see more litigation around signature matching because it is a silent way in which lawful votes get get discarded. And again, that was the when we looked at that data in Colorado, we saw a clear partisan effect to the signature matching standards that are used there. And then the last um, 
piece of this, which is by far and away the most controversial, and there'll be people on this call who don't agree with me, and that's fine, uh, is to allow community organizations to help collect and deliver sealed voted ballots. No one's talking about collecting unsealed ballots or voting them or anything like that. We're talking about um, collecting and delivering for counting sealed ballots. Um, this is what the nature of the Arizona law was. Um, uh, ballot collection is vital in many rural parts of America, particularly on Native American reservations where there's no on-reservation on mail service. So the only way to get these ballots delivered is to, is to drive them off reservation. And if you make everyone drive their own ballot, it's obviously suppressive versus letting someone collect them and deliver them. So we're really talking about allowing local community organizations to play that function under a appropriate safeguards. Um, uh, the Native American tribes in Montana are currently suing a recent prohibition in their state, uh, and I am also suing um, Minnesota over a similar law there. So that is, um, in a nutshell, kind of where, where um, things are. I think uh, the Congress, just uh, both the House Democrats and Senate Democrats put in their bills um, proposed text that would f provide billions of dollars in funding and a right to vote by mail, along with uh, uh, additional expansion of early voting. And both bills, importantly, from my perspective in the vote by mail, include all four of these pillars. Um, I assume McConnell is block will, will do everything he can to prevent that th these provisions from being included in final passage. Uh, and then, unless Congress is able to <clears throat> muster a vote around it, uh, the vote is the the struggle is going to go to the states, and it's going to be a question of pressing local election officials, secretaries of state, election officials at the state level, and governors to exercise the power they have to ensure that every um, eligible citizen can cast the ballot and have that ballot counted. And that last piece about making sure it's counted uh, is um, uh, is uh, is really vitally important. Ultimately, if states are recalcitrant or can't can't rise to the occasion that we find ourselves, then there's going to be litigation. I'm currently litigating 20 plus cases already against uh, Republican state legislative voter suppression efforts, um, and I expect we'll bring more. Um, <clears throat> some of them are on behalf of the Democratic Party, as was mentioned. I represent the DNC, the DSC, and the DCCC. Some of them are on behalf of progressive. Um, uh, 501c3 and c4 organizations that um, uh, promote voting rights uh, for all. So if, fo if folks have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. So with that, I will turn it back. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. That was incredibly helpful. Um, I will just say that we're still taking questions. We've received quite a few, um, but send your questions still to info at jewishdems.org. Um, we'll start with Jerry in New York. Um, I, I know you addressed this, but we're still I'm going to ask it because it is a, a cause of great concern for so many of us. Um, and this has to do with the chances that elections might be suspended in November. Uh, you were very clear saying that we can take it to the bank. It's in the Constitution. But are there any um, any extraordinary circumstances in which there could be a delay, perhaps if uh, if there was some sort of national emergency in the country, if the president had an executive order, is there any situation in which the November election could be delayed? Yeah, the, the answer is no. I mean, absent Congress changing the law. So the U.S. Constitution gives gives states the ability to set the time, place, and manner of elections, but gives Congress an override authority. Uh, and Congress has, by the way, used that override authority in a number of uh, instances, including setting a national election day. But they've used it in other places. Those, any of you who've ever cast a military or overseas ballot, a so-called UACAVA ballot, um, has benefited from uh, a congressional override of the state's authority. And Congress has spoken clearly as to the date of the election. I think the thing that people ought to be worrying about is not that there is going to be a cancellation of election day, but that there could be some type of action that simply makes getting to the polls impractical or difficult um, on a targeted basis. And that is something that I worry about. Um, you know, so it wouldn't be the canceling of elections. It would be the, the inhibiting of, of access to voting, which is part of why making widespread vote by mail is so important, whether it's because of coronavirus or just, you know, or long lines due to human error or suppression 
you know, that that we've seen, you know, for 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 in 1981, the Republican Party ran a voter suppression program in New Jersey where they had off duty police officers with guns, with sidearms showing and radios blaring, um, patrolling uh, minority precincts that led to a consent decree that they enter into that prohibited them from running those kinds of programs. Um, uh, that consent decree was lifted at the end of 2016, after the election in December. So, you know, we're going to see those kinds of suppressive activities. Uh, the Republican Party already announced a $10 million budget to fight my lawsuits. Um, I kid you not. They announced they're going to spend $10 million to side to enter on the other side of the lawsuits that I have filed um, uh, to promote voter suppression. So I worry a lot about that kind of stuff and whether governors or, you know, governmental entities could sort of join in that in, in by making voting harder and and access harder. I worry about that. I don't really worry about um, Election Day not happening on on uh, uh, on the right day. Great. Okay. And from Barbara in Sarasota, how long would it take us in this country to change from our mixed system of in-person and vote by mail just to entirely vote by mail? And is it possible that there's also a third option of online voting? So good, both good questions. So um, I think it would be very difficult, and you know there are there are organizations, um, uh, you know, good organizations that are pushing to move us to nationwide only vote by mail, no in person voting. Um, I don't think that that's going to happen for 20. In fact, it's not going to happen for 2020, and it, you know it takes many years to to build that infrastructure. In part because when you move to an only vote by mail system, you need to mail people their ballots proactively, which means you have need to have really, really, really good lists of who gets a ballot and where they live. And more transient populations like students can be left out of that equation unless it's done unless unless that data is really good and clean and not every state has really good clean voter registration data to know where people are to send them ballots. So um so I don't think that's going to be for 2020. For 2020 I think we're we're looking at a mixed system and just making sure that there's greater access. Um in terms of online voting, you know, there is definitely um there are organizations out there that are piloting or looking at promoting online voting. I, my own sense of that is that is that before it is used in federal elections, it's going to be piloted in um, smaller elections. You know, we'll see it, we'll see it rolled out in city elections. We'll see it rolled out in ballot initiative elections, local, and then once it starts to gather sort of proof of concept, once people start to get more comfortable with it, then I think um, at that point you may see it um, uh, with greater rollout. But, but I think that's gonna, that'll, that'll take a little bit of time because there are, there are security questions people have, um, but there's also access questions about you know, who has access to uh, online um, uh, voting and, and, and how exactly to, to handle that. So um, I think that that's, you know, definitely in the roadmap, but I don't think that's in the roadmap for 2020. Great. Um, you had mentioned displaced students. Um, Matthew had a question. Uh, how can we assure that all the students who registered to vote on campus can get their absentee ballots at home and assuming they will be voting by mail? Yeah, really great question. Look, I you know, I've I've brought probably more lawsuits under the 25th amendment than uh uh 26th amendment rather than than uh, than anyone, which is the 18-year-old right to vote amendment. Um and that's because states tend to treat students and for that matter young voters generally as kind of an afterthought. Um and so I think it's you know there is no population that is as that is is often targeted um, for overt discrimination as college students and 18 to 21 year old voters generally. Um, I think it's going to be incumbent on the states, and we need to pressure the states that they need to accommodate the change in student location in the same way 
that they would accommodate it, you know, after, you know, um, any natural disaster, after, you know, a hurricane in Florida, uh, you know, a, um, uh, you know, Superstorm Sandy in New Jersey. We need to we need to take the same level of seriousness. Uh, the floods in Houston. We need to take the same level of seriousness to students who were essentially, in many instances, while they were on spring break, or or at, in between some you know in between classes, were essentially told they couldn't go back, um, and and therefore it's really to disenfranchise those students is um, uh, it is literally. Uh, taking their right to vote out from under them without giving them any uh, alternative. And it's not something they brought upon themselves because they, they were given no notice uh, or very short notice that their colleges were taking these steps. So I think we really need to pressure uh, uh, the states. And one of the things I found, I sued Florida over a law. They had a law that let that let early vote centers be put in any public building except college campuses. Um, so I sued so that they could put college, they could put early vote centers at University of Florida and Florida State among the other universities in Florida. And um, what I what I I came to realize is that oftentimes the biggest advocates for this are the are the student groups, but also getting the support of the universities. Um, you know, get get the support of a University of North Carolina, which was a big advocate to push back on an ID law in North Carolina that would have disenfranchised their students. Get the University of Florida provost, you know, who was a supporter of of this early vo this early voting sites. Like engage the universities themselves to sought to be part of the push for their students because they carry a lot of a lot of sway oftentimes in their state legislator state legislatures or in their counties great uh we have a clarification question from jan in brooklyn you mentioned the third pillar regarding signatures and i think this had to do with signature verification can you explain more what this means and how it's used to disenfranchise people yeah, so um, this is a great question coming from someone in New York, since New York has very little vote uh, vote by mail or absentee voting. It's one of the, I think, 17 states that still requires an excuse to vote. Um, and by the way, for those of you in New York, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order uh, saying that um, uh, COVID-19 for the primary would be considered an excuse, would be considered an illness, uh, even if you don't have it, just the, the you know the risk of getting it would be an excuse, and 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 we need to we need to be pushing on Governor Cuomo and and governors throughout the country where there is excuse voting that 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 fear of 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 getting COVID virus is not just a now, but it's unfortunately going to be with us in the fall. There, God willing, there'll be less of it around, but um, but you know it's unlikely to be extinct and that the executive orders that are extending that as an excuse need to need to be for the general as well but in any event so basically when you vote by mail or vote absentee in most states not every state minnesota's got a slightly different system there are some other states with slightly different systems but the overwhelming majority of states when you vote by mail or absentee you complete your ballot and then you put it in an envelope and that envelope then goes inside the outer envelope. The outer envelope is the envelope that gets sealed and stamped or it has pre-stamped and it has the address of where it goes. And then usually on the back of that envelope, you provide information as to who you are um, and you sign it. And the reason is that this way, before they open your ballot, they can check to see whether or not you're on the voter rolls, whether you've already voted, you know, whatever. And in that verification process, most states will compare the signature where you signed that outer envelope with the signature they have, in, have on file for you. Um, that signature they have on file is usually your voter registration application um, uh, signature. Some states, it's also the application for the absentee ballot itself. So they will usually have one signature or two signatures they are then comparing it against. The problem is that, um, first of all, many people's signatures don't match anyway. They sign their name one way one time and another way another time. Second is that increasingly as people um, sign up to register to vote online or using digital um, 
signature pads. Their signature on a signature pad doesn't look the same as it does with a wet signature with ink. So just imagine like when you're at, you know, when you're at the grocery store and you sign on one of those digital things, very oftentimes people have a different signature on those digital only than they do if they're signing their name, for example, um, on an official document. So that creates mismatches. But the but beyond those, what we know is that human beings are very poor judges of whether two signatures match. In fact, those of you who are lawyers on this call know there's actually a federal rule of evidence that would prohibit in court a lay witness offering an opinion as to whether or not two people's signatures match. And yet that's exactly what's going on with these in virtually every state or not virtually in many, many states is you have you have, ele you have untrained election officials who are looking at signature one on the envelope, looking at the, the specimen signatures on file, and they're simply making a judgment call whether they think it matches or doesn't match. And in some states, if it does, and, and if it doesn't match, then the vote doesn't count. And in some states, like Michigan, there's no requirement that the voter is even told that the signature didn't match. So the voter doesn't even get an opportunity to contest it or to fix it. They just, their ballot just gets uncounted. So they think they voted, but their vote didn't count. And this is a real problem. Um, as I mentioned, there's good, strong data that shows that signature matching does not equally distribute, um, uh, signature mismatching does not equally distribute across all populations. It tends to skew younger and it tends to skew um, uh, 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 less Caucasian. So, so it is a, so it is not a, 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 it has a, it has an electoral um, um, uh, thumb on the scale. So there are things that we've recommended to make that better. Um, in the House, in the Senate bill that was just passed, for example, uh, if your signature is deemed not to match by an election official. It has to be shown to two others. So, so three election officials need to look at any signature mismatch. And unless it's unanimous beyond a reasonable doubt, then the signature counts. Um, one of the three has to be of the opposite party. So it can't just be Republicans or just Democrats. If then it doesn't count, you are notified by email, text, phone, or mail, whatever they have available, and you're able to correct through any of those. So if you if you get an email that says your signature didn't match, you can email back and say, oh, but that was my signature. I just I it's a new it's a, it's a different than it used to be. If they call you, you can tell them on the phone. Yep, no, that was me. Um, rather than the current system in many states where you have to fill out a form, maybe go in person uh, to to the county's uh, county clerk's office. Um, so there are things we can do to make signature matching less bad and more um, and reject fewer ballots. Great. I'm going to combine some questions now. Uh, Deborah and Martin in California asked, is it true that under a declared state of emergency in a state, governors have the authority to change the method of voting in their state? That's the first question. The second question related from Gabriella in New Jersey, what happens if the population is still under a state of emergency, but Republicans don't budge on expanding our voting options and therefore require in-person voting. Is there a backup plan? Yeah, so those are two really important questions. The first goes to the extent to which governors have emergency power, and that is somewhat state by state. Um, you, I know I can tell you from California other than you said it because, yes, in California, there's a specific um, provision that gives Governor uh, Newsom that authority. Um, some states are less clear. My own view is, and I've I've expressed this to a couple of Democratic governors personally, and I've expressed it to the press who's asked about this. My own view is that if a governor is taking reasonable steps to ensure people can have the right to vote, I think courts are going to be very deferential. I think courts are not going to are not going to question governors adding additional methods of voting to ensure voter participation. I think the reverse is not true. I think where governors are using as excuse to cut back on on voter participation, then I do think it's suspect. Um, I think the second question, though, is like is kind of like the thing that keeps me up at night. So thanks for asking. Like, so let's assume for a moment that Congress doesn't appropriate necessary funds to states, and um, Republican legislatures don't budge, and we wind up roughly, and you know, and we'll bring lawsuits 
you know, as many places as we can. Um, you know, then what? Um, and the answer is it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a real problem because, like I said, we had seven and a half hour long lines in Texas during the primary without COVID. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, bins overflowing with uh, returned uh, absentee and uh, ma- vote by mail ballots in California uh, in 2018 without COVID. So, like you know, we were before COVID, we were talking about the need to radically expand the number of polling places, the number of people who vote early, just because of the surge of enthusiasm and the surge of voting that we're going to likely see in 2020. Well, if now you put COVID in in there, I assure you for every voter who doesn't show up in person due to COVID, an election worker doesn't. And the only difference is if a voter doesn't show up, one person gets disenfranchised. If an election worker doesn't show up, hundreds of people get disenfranchised. So unless we do some really, really bold things to ensure that polls are going to open in person, um, and that there'll be sufficient early voting uh, and machinery and everything to handle in-person voting. I mean, in-person voting is just going to be a, is going to be is going to grind to a halt. And then if you don't have absentee voting as a backup, then you know we're going to see epically long lines and we're going to see lower rates of participation because people won't want to wait in the lines. People won't want to go out and be ex- potentially exposed, um, and there will just be a shortage of avenues for people to vote. So it's really, really important that we press everything we can. Like I said, what I'm mostly doing is right now talking to folks like you and others and trying to, you know, sound the alarm. And then, um, you know, my role in this process is litigation, right? Like I bring cases to sue states to adopt better voting laws. Um, But there are other organizations, Fair Fight, you know, Stacey Abrams' organization does tremendous work at the state level. They've got voter protection programs in a number of states. All Voting is Local, which is run by um, uh, the um, uh, the, uh, Vanita Gupta, the... um, uh, not the lawyers committee, the um, I always, I, leadership council, leadership council on civil rights, uh, runs an organization called All Voting is Local, which is kind of the 501c3 equivalent of of what Fair Fight is doing on the sort of partisan side. Um, but we need to we need to fund and empower these organizations to do their jobs in trying to push at the very local level access to voting, and then when things fail. You know, uh, we need to support organizations that that bring litigation to to bring these challenges. And uh, you know, the DSCC, the DCCC, the DNC all all have legal funds that they raise money into, um, and so, so do some of the other, you know, progressive organizations. Great, and that leads to another question regarding what role we can all play. Um, you know, it sounds it sounds to me like uh, because JDCA plays a role in advocating for our values, including um, giving our supporters opportunities to ask their members of Congress to vote for certain things. It sounds like this funding in the in the coronavirus relief bill is critical. The funding for vote by mail. Uh, is, is. is that something that you're encouraging us to do? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. What other steps can we be doing? Okay. Yeah. So a hundred percent. So. You know, um, uh, I grew up on Long Island in a very um, uh, a very politically active synagogue. Actually, I moved to Rockland County, um, but and and you know, I was raised in a tradition that that it's it, the first obligation that Jews have is to make sure that um, that we not only look after our own communities, but but other communities that may be targeted or struggling. And this, these voting prohibitions and limitations and challenges, they are going to challenge the Jewish American community, but they're really going to challenge um, student communities and communities of color. And so we need to be telling Congress and our members of Congress that they need to include um, these voting provisions in, in law. Um, I know that Senator Schumer and Speaker um, Pelosi have been fighting uh, for this. I don't know any more than you do where this is all going to come out with this bill, but I assume, though, if not this bill, there'll be another bill. Um, but the Brennan Center, you know, which is really the gold standard around these kinds of studies, says it'll be two to three billion dollars needed for states 
to operate elections, and they don't have that money. So we need to we need to press our members of Congress um, uh, uh, on this, and we need to speak out as a Jewish community about the importance of this, even if it doesn't affect us, uh, but it affects our neighbors and our friends um, and our allies. We need to we need to speak out um, uh, uh, on how important it is, and not turn an turn an eye because it doesn't affect. Uh, it doesn't affect us in our, in, you know, if you're in Oregon, it doesn't affect you in your state or it doesn't affect you in your community. So I would ask you to, I'd ask you to call Congress. I'd ask you to post on social media about it. I'd ask you to, to speak out about it. Um, because even if you can't, even if we can't solve this at a national level, we may be able to solve particular problems in particular communities at the state level, at the county level. You know, there was a study that showed that African Americans on average spend 30% longer in lines than, than whites. This was a study that came out. There was a Washington Post editorial op-ed about it, rather. Um, and, you know, in there are, there are counties like Fairfax County, Virginia, where that's where where the differential between whites and blacks is dramatic in wait times. So, like, you know, I live in Fairfax County, Virginia. So, like, tell the county board of supervisors in elections, like, they need to they need to fix that. They need to make sure that everyone is getting an equal access uh, to polls. And it's not, you know, we're not overpopulating some polling locations and under-resourcing um, others. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. That was incredibly helpful. And we, we're on it. We will create an action item for our supporters to, uh, to lobby their members of Congress or write to their members of Congress urging them to support the uh, funding in the, in the relief bill for states to facilitate vote by mail. Uh, so this is very helpful. Thank you for all the work that you do to ensure and safeguard uh, our right to vote as Americans. And thank you for talking about the role specifically as Jews in terms of uh, protecting others. Uh, we agree, and we're working for this every day. So thank you so much for your leadership. And, and thank you for everything you guys do. I really appreciate it. You're a great organization, and I'm, like I said, honored to be your first speaker in this series. Great. And I just want to preview for everyone else uh, our next calls. Um, we will be having these calls every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Our next call will be this Thursday, March 26th. It will be looking at the national security implications of coronavirus, uh, including um, how we can solve this issue globally, but also uh, the consequences of President Trump's decision to eliminate the National Security Council office responsible for its pandemic response. Um, and we're going to hear from experts who served in the NSC, Ned Price, who was the former special assistant to the president and the national security spokesperson. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, the president's reluctance to invoke the Defense Protection Act. Uh, and we'll hear from the former chief of staff, the secretary of defense, and the former uh, chief of staff to the secretary, or to the director of the CIA, Jeremy Bash. Um, next Tuesday, we're going to look at the economic impact of coronavirus. Uh, we'll hear from Sarah Bloom Raskin, who's the former Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. And on Thursday, we will hear from Randy Weingarten, who's the President of the American Federation of Teachers, about the impact of the virus on education. So thank you so much uh, for joining our first call. I'm going to briefly turn it back over to Ron Klein, our Chairman, just to end. And we hope to uh, continue to convene every Tuesday and Thursday at three. You can plan on it. And we're going to provide wonderful speakers like Mark. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Haley. And uh, thank you, Michael, for your uh, um, bringing together for us uh, what was happening in Georgia. Mark, this was particularly informative. Um, I think people are asking the questions that you were able to provide answers today and what we should be concerned about, how we can advocate and encourage the states where we come from to make sure that they get this right. This is not a democratic thing. This is an American vote. Every vote should count equally. Uh, and anybody who pushes back on that, uh, you know, really ought to be ashamed of themselves, uh, be they Democrat or Republican for that matter. Um, Republicans for some reason have taken this position that they want to skew the system. Uh, I wouldn't say that every Republican wants to do that, but certainly their leadership has, and they've done everything they can to stand in the way. So mark your lawsuits and your advocacy and your speaking out and giving us the tools that we can use to uh, fight this fight are very important. Um, for those of you on the call, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I want to 
point you to our website, www.jewishdems.org. It has not only the list of the events coming up that Haley mentioned, it also has uh, lists of the uh, chapters that we've set up in different states, college campuses where we have fellows and are working to organize uh, the vote and activities in those places. Uh, we want your insight. We want your uh, information from wherever you live and how we can help. Uh, and we also, uh, to the extent you can, we want your financial support. Uh, if you look on the website, you will see, uh, again, jewishstems.org, all that information. And uh, we look forward to working with you to uh, to get our country back in a, in a good place in the fall. And through everybody's effort and one vote at a time, we're going to get there. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.